It's wonderful to be able to give you uh, some teaching from God's Word for enrichment this year. I'm going to miss being with all of you, but I'm delighted to be able to serve you. And I pray that wherever you are, that God is blessing you. Uh, I've been given the task this week of teaching some lessons from John's first epistle. This is a great book of the Bible, and I'm only sorry that I can't do the whole book. But I'll do three sermons, three passages that are... Um, that really will highlight the book. And I think that you'll find 1 John to be a tremendous blessing. Now, the first passage we're going to do is 1 John 1, verse 7. And let me read that, and I'll pray. And let's look at this great verse together. John writes, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. Father in heaven, Thank you for the Rafiki Foundation. Thank you for so many friends I have there whose faces I can't see, but uh, you see them, Lord, and I pray that your blessing would be with them. Bless this year's enrichment and uh, cause your word, Lord, to give us life, and it does. So we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. I think that the Apostle John wanted to summarize in a single verse the message of his first letter, that he would take his finger and he would place it on chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, first John, as a whole, defends the person and work of Jesus, and John exhorts the church to a life of truth, holiness, and love in fellowship with God. Now, all of those themes are contained in this verse. If we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, Benjamin Morgan Palmer describes this verse as a camera lens in which the entire Christian landscape is seen. It sets forth, he says, the gospel not only in its theology, but in its practical development and in the experience of the Christian on earth. And for this reason, if one could memorize only a single verse from 1 John, and fortunately, you can memorize all of it if you want. But if you only had to pick one verse, I think most Christians would pick this verse. 1 John 1, 7 reminds us that one either is a Christian or is not. We either walk in the darkness or we walk in the light. Moreover, if we walk in the light, having true communion with God, the result is fellowship with one another and a conscience that has rest from the burden of sin. Well, it's important that we comprehend what John means by this metaphor when he says, if we walk in the light. Now, you probably know that the metaphor of walking refers to a lifestyle, a whole pattern of living. And to walk in the light is the opposite of walking in darkness. John had referred to walking in darkness in the previous verse. And darkness is the realm that's opposed to God in doctrine and in life. Someone may, lead, someone may lead a very respectable life. They may do very many good things and yet deny God in a life of pride and self-sovereignty. In Romans one twenty one, Paul spoke of people who, despite all the evidence of God around them, did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. And as a result, they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. John Calvin writes, he walks in darkness who is not ruled by the fear of God and who does not with a pure conscience devote himself wholly to God and seek to, prom to promote his glory. Now the realm of darkness will strongly tend, as you know, towards sinful, sinful thoughts and deeds. But the essence of a light, of, of walking in the darkness, is a life of neglecting the gospel living apart from true faith in Jesus. And likewise, a walk to walk in the light then, at the essence of it, is to know Christ and to, and to trust him so that we seek after God. Martin Lloyd-Jones writes, men and women who walk in the light are people who are seeking God. They desire to know God better. They are concerned about the glory and honor of God. They are anxious to please God. Now, I think the best way to unfold John's meaning is to consult, when he, when he uses this term, walking in the light, is to consult his use of that term in other passages. In 3 John, and 3 John is a very good letter, 
And in verses 3 and 4, he, Paul, uh, John rejoices that his reader is walking in the truth. And then he says this, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And so walking in the light is walking in the truth. And John was combating false teaching concerning primarily the person and work of Christ. And so he, he means that truth especially is faith in Jesus as the incarnate God, Son of God, who died for our sins. To walk in the truth is to confess, this is very much John's emphasis, it's to confess the apostolic doctrine of Jesus, to trust in his death for our reconciliation with God. Now, more generally, to walk in the truth, then, means to receive the Bible as the Word of God. It is to say with Psalm 36, verse 9, In your light do we see light. Now, that raises the question, are we people of the book? Not merely an outward conviction, but an actual devotion and piety and practice. Are we living in a daily conversation with the Bible? I hope you know what I'm talking about. Your life's a, a conversation with God through his word. Paul says we are being transformed by the renewal of our mind. Now, if we're not, there's little wonder if our experience as believers falls short of the thing that John is hoping for here. To walk in the light is to walk in the truth. Now, he also uses that expression of walking in Second John verse 6. And there he urges us to walk according to his commandments. You see, here's the moral dimension of walking in the light. There's a doctrinal dimension, but there's a moral dimension. The Christian believes God's truth and then acts on it. Saving faith involves a change of life. Believers are saved from the law's condemnation for sin, but then we live according to the law's precepts. Charles Spurgeon would say, Christ saved us from the law and then has sent us back to the law. Now, the New Testament, you know, always links truth and life. Uh, Jesus said at the beginning of his ministry, repent and believe the gospel, Mark 1.15. And so as we come to faith in Jesus, we begin to see sin and the world for what they are. And we turn to God, yes, to be forgiven, but also to be delivered, as Colossians 1.13 puts it, delivered from the domain of darkness. Now, John does not mean, I need to be clear about this, John does not mean that those who walk in the light are freed completely from the presence and even the practice of sin. Now, there have been people, many people in the history of, uh, of Bible interpretation, I think particularly in the last century, who've taken walking in the light to mean that we must attain to spiritual perfection. But if you go forward another verse, you see that John makes clear in 1 John 1, 8, that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. You see, the truth in which we walk declares that we are sinners saved only by God's grace through Jesus' death. And so, instead of a life of perfection to which we are not going to attain in this life, John means that we instead, we've taken God's word as our guide. We're being taught by God's grace to live prayerfully in a new and holy way. In his gospel, John put it this way, whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. That you have the light involving both truth and, and, and godliness. Sinclair Ferguson has pointed out that how we walk is determined by the influence we are under. A man influenced by alcohol will reveal that influence by the manner in which he walks. Likewise, one who lives in the light of God, Ferguson says, will demonstrate that by the way he walks in the will of God. He will discover God's will for his life by obedience for the, to the Lord's will for every believer's life. Well, I'm in meeting with Christians to discuss challenges in their lives, I often find myself referring to this verse, 1 John 1, 7, uh, in part because of the two results that John says we can expect if we will walk in the light, if we will walk in truth and in godliness. He says two things are going to result here. And the first is this, that by walking in the light, he says we will have fellowship with one another. So to walk in the light is, 
uh, to walk under the word of God and in a godly, Christ-honoring way means that we'll have community, we'll have love, we'll have fellowship with other believers. Now, it might come as a surprise that John puts it that way, because I think our natural inclination would be that if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with God. Now, that's true, of course, but it's something John has actually already said in this letter. He said in the beginning that uh, we have fellowship with God, uh, and, and he invites us into that with him. And so he's assuming, he says, as we walk in the light, as he is in the light. First John 1 John 1.5 says, God is light, in him is, there's no darkness at all. And so if we walk in the light as he is in the light, yes, we have a right relationship of fellowship with God. But, but that's not what he highlights. Again, he assumes that. But what he insists is what we actually have is fellowship with one another. And, and he, by the way, as he puts it this way, he really expresses it as an obligation. He's countering false teachers. Part of the background for 1 John are these false teachers, the Antichrist, he's going to call them in chapter 2. And they're denying the, the apostolic doctrine of Christ. Primarily, they're denying uh, the true manhood of the incarnate Son of God. Had a lot of theories about how the Christ was a spirit who came and used Jesus for a while and then left Jesus. And they were false teachers. And what they did was they schismed themselves. They left the church and they were draw, drawing other people out of the church with them. And so he's going to emphasize here, uh, if you really walk in the light, you're not going to be a schismatic. You're going to be one who fellowships with fellow believers. B.F. Westcott writes, love of the brothers is the product of the love of God. Fellowship with the brethren is proof of fellowship with God. Now, John said in 1 John 1, 3, that he as an apostle gave his witness to the incarnation so that you may have fellowship together with us. You see, it's fellowship with God together with the believers. Now, those then who walk with God will want to worship him. Together with his people, we will care about other people whom God loves. Hebrews 10.25 urges us to hold our confession, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. Terry Johnson writes, we will find in the church like-minded people with whom we can make common cause in the gospel. We will find fellow disciples with the same perspective on life, the same priorities and goals. Isn't that true? It becomes natural and desirable to join with them, participating in and sharing the things of Christ. Let me talk briefly about my own experience, which really, I think, highlights this necessity of Christian fellowship. I know it's important for Rafiki folks, because you're sometimes uh, in some far-flung places. You're, on a, you're, you're in a town together, in a, in a, in a village together. You've you got to love one another, because there's not that many in many cases, and and I had the same experience when I was a new convert. I came to Christ at age 30. I had heard the gospel preached in the church. And for a number of months, I, I walked across the town. I was in Philadelphia, 10th Presbyterian Church, and I would sit alone. And I didn't meet anybody, but I was being thrilled by the word of God. I'm growing. I'm, I'm learning scripture. There's a lot of change happening in my life. And yet at the same time, I was struggling to break with many of the social habits that I had begun in my former life and had been entrenched in. But one of the biggest things that happened to me was I began attending a Bible study. I actually met some people my own age, and I started uh, fellowshipping with them. I made some good godly friends, and, and their example and their encouragement and their fellowship played a major role in what was a whole lifestyle renovation during my two years of graduate school. When After I'd been converted, I left there radically changed, yes, primarily by God's word. But I never want to underestimate or downplay the influence of friendships with godly people, like-minded believers. What an encouragement they were to me. And that's why a healthy church will not only preach God's word and will worship according to scriptures, but will aggressively enfold people into its fellowship and community. Now, some may put it this way. That's good for a new convert like you were, Rick. Uh, you needed to learn the basics, but look, I've advanced to a point where I no longer need fellow Christians, especially, you know, those who are weaker than I am and less advanced. Well, John's answer is no, that is not true. If we walk in the light, we will have fellowship with one another. 
You see, those who seek after God will seek after fellow believers. They desire to join with them in worship and work. And, and if others are weak and inexperienced, well, then what we'll do is we'll put our God-given gifts to work in lovingly helping them along. Moreover, a Christian simply never graduates beyond his or her need of encouragement and fellowship in ministry. I think of David when he was beset by doubts in First Samuel 13 and his covenant friend Jonathan came to him and the text says he strengthened his hand in God. There's not one of us who doesn't need to have his or her hand strengthened in God. We, we need each other. We need this fellowship. Or you think of Paul at the end of his life. I don't think any of us are more advanced than the Apostle Paul in his writing Second Timothy. And he was so conscious of his need of fellowship. Do your best to come to me soon, he says. Second Timothy 4.9. Just as he asked the, the Ephesians to pray also for me. Now, not only does walking in the light obligate us to fellowship with other believers, but part, John is partly saying it, it actually makes it possible. And it makes it actually happen. Sin, of course, wants to be kept in the darkness, and there it will grow. There it will be protected from the light of God's word. And so to walk in the light is also a mode of fellowship, one of openness where we confess our sins. We admit them. We don't life, let, let strife to linger. How important this is to uh, marriage. It is to realize that we ourselves are forgiven, and so we therefore forgive others. Walking in the light means growing in grace and godliness so that our patience, our kindness, our gentleness expand, and the spirit of grace pervades our homes and relationships. For many professing Christians, this call to walk in the light is a pressing issue, a pressing issue. You see, by walking in the truth of God's word, no longer concealing our sin, seeking God's glory in a life of growing obedience, our marriages, our homes, our relationships, our churches will be warmed by God's grace. If we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Well, that's the first main result of walking in the light, our relationship and fellowship with other believers. But John concludes the verse by adding the peace of conscience we gain before God. And this, of course, becomes important because as we live in fellowship with God, as we walk with God, if our minds and our hearts are really open to his word, inevitably we will be crushed by our increasing awareness of how sinful we really are. You see, here's the dilemma that a Christian inevitably faces to have fellowship with God. I must live in the light of his word, but that same word exposes to me my utter depravity so that I cannot bear to be near to God. I think an illustration of this truth was discovered by a professional golfer who had won a prize some years ago, and the prize included a ground of golf with uh, the President of the United States and Billy Graham. And after they played the round, this professional golfer was seen on the, on the, on the practice rounds, uh, furiously smashing balls, just grinding, and so frustrated and angry. He was just smashing balls off the practice tees, and, and one of his friends saw how angry he was, and he asked him, what, what was it? And he said, I didn't need to have religion shoved down my throat for 18 holes. Ah, his friend said, so Billy Graham really came on pretty strong, didn't he? And the man said, you know, he didn't mention religion once, didn't say a word. Is he just being in the presence of a saintly believer had, had bitterly convicted him of his sin and he didn't have the resources to deal with it? Well, how much greater is the shock when we fellowship with God? Indeed, one proof that we really have been with God is that we are stricken with a sense of guilt. You think of Isaiah in Isaiah 6 when he saw that vision. Isaiah came into the temple not because he was convicted of his own sins. He was worried about other people's sins. But when he sees God, the first woe, the first of many woes spoken by the prophet Isaiah is on himself. Woe is me, he says. The vision of God and fellowship with God destroyed him in that sense. Of course, the Lord atoned for his sins and restored him. Or I think of Peter. Peter's out on the boat with Jesus. 
uh, early in his ministry, and he's fishing, and, and you, you know the story. Jesus tells him to put his net on a certain side of the boat. I've always thought that was funny. Peter, knowing how Peter is, he probably thought these preachers think they know everything. He's telling me how to fish, but whatever, he does it. And of course, you know that the, the nets are filled with fish. And he is aware through that that the person with, he, who, with whom he's dealing is actually divine. And, and how does Peter respond to that? Is he chummy? Does he say, hey, Jesus, it's nice to hang out with you? That's not what he says. He says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. You see, to walk with God and to really be in his presence, to really can read, to see his word, is to be bitterly convicted of our sin and corruption. Well, well, how then can we walk in the light and have peace in our consciences when we are constantly assaulted by the holiness of God and our own corruption? Well, John gives the answer at the end of verse 7, and the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. You see, here we have the gospel truth that is so essential to a healthy Christian life. I, I think for missionaries, you're zealous people. That's why I like you. And you're trying to do things for the Lord. And I know you're down and you're going to be hard on yourselves. And it's easy to feel like we're failing and letting the Lord down. No, no, no. The, here's our relationship with God, our peace with him. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us of all sin. John wants us to walk in the truth. And the great truth is that God's son came into this world to pay this penalty our sins deserve that we might be forgiven by God. In this letter, John furiously defends both the humanity and the deity of Jesus against the false teacher, and he does so because he knows the truth about Jesus' incarnation. He says, we have seen and looked upon and touched him with our hands. He has a surpassing concern for the glory of God and his Son, but he also knows that the truth concerning Jesus is the only way we can actually live in fellowship with God. Now, so important is this statement that the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin, that we should carefully consider it. What does John mean, for instance, by the blood of Jesus? Well, one source of confusion, you may have heard or read it, it teaches that Jesus' blood refers to the life principle that was in him and it was spilled out. Now, for some mystical, mystical believers especially, the, the physical blood of Jesus is thought to have life-giving powers. But there's not the slightest doubt that when Paul says the blood of Jesus, he means the death of Jesus. The blood is the emblem, the emblem, the proof of his death. The wages of sin is death, and Jesus died to free us from the punishment of eternal death and condemnation. In Romans 5, 9 to 10, Paul puts them both together. He shows that they are one. He says, now we have been justified by his blood. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. The blood equals his death. And the blood of his son, Jesus, points out that God's son became a true man in order that he would die, that he would suffer a true physical and spiritual death on our behalf. Listen to Hebrews 2, 14 to 15. Since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might deliver those who, uh, through fear of death, were subject to lifelong slavery. You see, this is the reason for the incarnation. The eternal Son of God was born in the manger of Bethlehem so that he could be crucified on the cross of Calvary. And since that man, Jesus, is at the same time the eternal Son of God, you see, his death had infinite worth, sufficient worth, to pay the penalty of all our sins. I've always loved the words of Anselm of Canterbury in that medieval classic, Cur Deus Homo, Why Did God Become Man? Here's why God became man. The debt was so great that while man alone owed it, and only God could pay it, so the same person must be both man and God. Man owed the debt. Only God would, could pay it. God, his, the Son, became man. Now, ordinarily, I find that Christians think about the blood of Jesus in terms of our justification. And Paul says that we are justified by his grace as a gift. 
through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus by his blood to be received through faith, Romans 3, 24 to 25. And so if I want to enter into fellowship with God, I need the blood of Jesus. Now, what's interesting is that's not exactly the emphasis Paul, John has here. He would agree with that. But here the emphasis is I need the blood of Jesus not to enter into fellowship, but to remain in fellowship, to walk with him in fellowship while I am yet a sinner. In other words, he shows the cross of Jesus is just as vital to our sanctification as it is to our justification. Now, John points out that Jesus' death not only gains forgiveness and justification, but the sin itself is cleansed from believers. In the Old Testament, Israelites who became unclean were barred from the temple or tabernacle. They could not worship until the priest sprinkled upon them the atoning blood that made them clean. And Leviticus 14 shows this. And those rituals were symbolic of what Jesus would come into the world to do through his atoning death. Yes, we remain uh, unclean in and of ourselves, and when we feel unclean. We're aware of our sin, and we're kind of shocked by ourselves. We know that we're unclean, but then the blood of Christ is applied to believers, and the contagion of sin is cleansed. The word atonement originally meant cover, so that the sacrificial blood covered the believer's sin. But you see, Jesus' atoning death, unlike the Old Testament animal sacrifices, his atoning death has the effect not only of covering our sin before God, But when the cover is pulled back, the sin is not there to be found. The sin itself is removed. Now, when Jesus speaks of our cleansing, when John speaks of our cleansing in Christ, it's interesting that he uses the present tense. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us. An ongoing present reality. You see, far from saying that in order to have fellowship with God, we need to not sin. If you want to felt okay, you start off with the blood of Christ, but now you gotta you gotta play it straight. You gotta you'll have fellowship with God if you never sin anymore. That's not what he says. He does he doesn't want us to sin, but he knows that we do sin. And he says, though we sin, our union with Christ has the effect of washing the stain away. John Stott writes, God does more than forgive. He washes the stain of sin. And the present tense shows that this is a continuous process. If we walk in the light, God has made provision to cleanse us from whatever sin would otherwise mar our fellowship with him or each other. We do not make our sins right by making penance penance, or uh, offering God promises that we're likely never to keep. Rather, it's Christ, our Savior, who cleanses our sins by his own blood. I. Howard Marshall writes, to say that the blood of Jesus purifies us is to say that sin is removed and forgiven. Its defiling effects no longer condemn us in the sight of God. Well, how precious then is the blood of Jesus? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Well, believers discover the shocking truth that instead, here's the the truth, it is shocking, that instead of Christianity making us feel better about ourselves, that's what critics say, oh, they think they're so much better than us, that actually is not the effect it has on us. It actually makes us feel worse about ourselves as we walk with Christ in faith. The Holy Spirit shows us sins we never imagined on the day of our conversion. The light of God's word reveals hidden, dark places of corruption. We don't feel better about ourselves, but we see more and more clearly the surpassing grace that is in Jesus Christ, his glory. We see how hopeless it is for sinners to justify themselves through works. And so we count faith in Jesus more precious than we even did before. And relying on him and his death, which cleanses us from sin, You see, now we fellowship with God in a spirit of humble gratitude for the son he gave because he loved us so infinitely much. I suggested that because of its great statement on Christ's cleansing blood that 1 John 1, 7 may be the most blessed verse in this whole letter. I actually think it is. But if that's true, the most blessed word in this verse must be the word all. All. 
You see, Jesus' death cleanses us not only of past sins, but of present sins, future sins as well. His blood washes not only those sins that we have been made aware of and that we've mechanically confessed before God, but also all those sins that we have not yet discovered. John's going to encourage us in verse 9 to confess the sins of which we are aware. But you see, to have Christ as our Savior through faith is not to have some. But what does he say? To have all of our sins washed away. Now, how can Christ cleanse all our sins? How can God not see the sins that are right there before him? Well, he gave his answer in that great New Testament, New Covenant promise that looked forward to the grace of Christ. God says, I will forgive their iniquities. I will remember their sins no more. You see, God remembers forgetting your sins because of the blood of Jesus. And what peace we have. What fellowship with God we know when we see that on his cross, Jesus has cleansed us of all our sins. He has washed us white as snow. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Well, I've said that I think the word all is the greatest word and the greatest verse of First John. Let me conclude by noting what is in the Greek text, the first word of 1 John 1, 7. It's the word if. John did not say if we walk perfectly in the light, but he did say if we walk in the light. And that means we must believe God's word when it says our salvation is found only in Jesus Christ. We must walk with God in faith, no longer seeking sin and self, but seeking to know and glorify God by the grace that he gives. To walk in the light is to repent and believe, believe and repent, repent and believe, believe and repent. It's to live in fellowship with people and to walk with God with consciences washed clean by the saving blood of Christ. In the opening lines of Romans chapter 6, Paul drew an essential distinction that John, I think, would undoubtedly endorse. At the end of Romans 5, he'd spoken boldly about God's grace and the triumph of grace over sin. He said said that when sin increases, grace abounds. But then he asked the question in Romans 6.1, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? That's the way unbelieving people think. If my sins have all been washed away, I can just keep sinning all the more. What I want to do is I I want to sin more, and and Jesus just serves that bad habit. Well, that's not what Paul's John's saying. You see, if our sins are cleansed by the blood of Christ, it is not that we want to sin more. We want to please and honor him. We want to glorify him. We want our lives to be a testimony to him. Paul's answer to the question uh, what shall we say then? Do we continue in sin that grace abounds? See, Paul says, no one who's actually been born again thinks that way. By no means, he said, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Romans 6, 2. And so if John's teaching about Christ's atoning death makes you want to sin more and more, well, then the reality is that you are not walking in the light. You're not saved. You don't have fellowship with God. But if you're trusting in Jesus, and though you sin, you grieve over it, and though you are weak, you crave power to honor God better, well, then John says the only explanation for that is that you're walking in the light as he is in the light. And if you are, your conscience may have peace in God's holy presence because the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all of our sins. Amen. And Father, we thank you for oh, all that's packed into this verse. It's all this gospel truth that you, you tell us we would never imagine it. And so, Father, inspire us to walk in the light. Help us to be careful in a, in a gracious way how we live. Let's be people of the truth, people of righteousness in a practical way, people who are walking in your light with your son, the Lord Jesus. And then, Lord, would you give us these blessings? I, I pray that our friends, our Rafiki friends, that they would have fellowship with one another because of the blood of Jesus. And they would have peace with you, living close to your heart, because the blood of your son has cleansed, is cleansing,
and will always cleanse all of our sin. How we love you, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.